This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Well, Thaddeus Tate was one of the pioneers here in Charlotte. A pioneer in business. There were almost no white barbers in the generation that Thad Tate came up in. A pioneer in the community. He ran the barbershop that catered to Charlotte's white business elite, government elite. And so he had the ear of Charlotte's leaders in a way that few other people did. Thad Tate was one of the leading African-American uh, Charlotteans a um, hundred years ago. We knew that what he meant to this community and the growth of this, not only this city, but this county. He partnered with people in the community to create things of, of lasting value. And now a bronze statue pays tribute to this local leader. In the next half hour, we explore the life of Thaddeus Lincoln Tate. The following episode of Trail of History is brought to you by Central Piedmont Community College and viewers like you. Thank you. And from Bragg Financial Advisors, a family-owned wealth management firm providing investment management and tax and estate planning for families, individuals, and institutions for nearly 50 years. Committed to our clients, to education, and our community. Hello, I'm Tony Zeiss, president of Central Piedmont Community College. You know, the rich and diverse history of the Charlotte region is just wonderful, and we at the college want to bring it to you and share it. We understand the importance of history. We understand the importance of learning from the past so that we can do better in the future. I want to tell you that you're in for a real treat. The History Department at Central Piedmont Community College has partnered with our television station to bring you this special one-of-a-kind history program. Stay tuned. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Hello and welcome to A Trail of History. I'm Gary Ritter. History shows us that it can take generations for our society to change. In Thaddeus Lincoln Tate's days at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, separate but equal was the law of the land. And as an African American, Tate faced many challenges. He started as a barber and a businessman, but through connections and determination, he quietly became an agent of change. Tate not only made a better life for himself, but also for his family and his community. In Uptown Charlotte. My name is Damian Johnson, and we're at No Grease Exclusive. Clippers and combs are the tools of the trade. Men try to come and get freshened up, look good. I don't like to use the word pretty, but uh, they come to get pretty. Johnson started cutting hair at age 12, following in his mother's footsteps. She did hair as long as I can remember. So she had her own salon in Buffalo, New York. His fascination with barbering led him to research its traditions and history, a history that he found deeply rooted in the African-American community yeah, yeah. with a direct connection to the time of slavery in America. Slaves were commonly taught specialized trades. That included barbering. The slaves had became very uh, skillful at, bar uh, at barbering because at that time, uh, their masters at the time really needed skilled laborers. And uh, the African-Americans at that time really had mastered the skill of uh, barbering. So in the 1800s, uh, late to mid 1800s, 80% uh, of all barbers were, were black. Uh, they had mastered it. They had became the most skilled at it. Following the Civil War, many former slaves, now known as freedmen, relied on these trades to earn a living. When the, when the slaves were freed, the uh, masters had made deals with the barbers to, uh, to uh, you know, start their own business. They would start their own business. Usually they would partner up with the masters of, at that time, uh, uh, or the white men that they had worked for at the time, and uh, they had created their own uh, enterprise in barbering. Barbering at the turn of the last century meant something very different than it does now. Barbers at the turn of the last century were uh, African-American leaders uh, because in slavery times there were not just the folks who worked in the field and the folks who worked in the house there was a small but extremely accomplished coterie of people who did all of the skilled trades 
working with horses, building things, um, planning farming. And those people, often well-educated, um, in not just in their trade, but generally in, in how to make the world work. And barbering was one of those personal service things that African Americans owned. Enter Thaddeus Lincoln Tate. There were almost no white barbers in the generation that Thad Tate came up in. Thaddeus Tate, who went by the name of Thad, was born in 1865 and moved to Charlotte in 1877. Mae Jackson is one of his granddaughters. He came from Western North Carolina, and he had help in being set up uh, in, in his business. And that's how he, you know, started uh, his being a barber. According to the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library website, cmstory.org, Tate opened his first shop in 1882. 100 years ago, Thad Tate was one of the most important people in Charlotte. He was a leader of the African American community. He was an independent business person, uh, ran a barber shop, which at that time was one of the, the leading professions for African Americans. And about 1890, he opened up inside the Central Hotel, which once stood at the corner of Trade and Tryon. The barber shop's location gave Tate a unique opportunity. He cut doctors, lawyers, politicians, other, you know, powerful businessmen. And like in any shop, uh, when men congregate like that, they're going to share ideals. They're going to share, uh, uh, you know, insight on different things. And he was one of those persons that uh, was trusted with information. He was trusted with resources. And they shared with one another. He had the ear of... Charlotte's leaders in a way that few other people did. And Thad Tate used his influence with white and black in Charlotte to build a stronger community. Thaddeus Tate was one of the pioneers here in Charlotte, <clears throat> not only for his, uh, his enterprise with, with uh, business, but what he was doing in the community, uh, the things that he was trying to do for African Americans here in Charlotte. Uh, and he had, he had teamed up with some, some powerful men here in Charlotte, the Belks and some other folks. So uh, when, I, when I think about that is Tate, you think of a pioneer. You know, he, he, he was a pioneer of his day. He took on the challenges of his time to, uh, I guess, to speak truth to power, in a sense, uh, not only with his words, but with his actions. And many of his actions led to some of his greatest accomplishments. In 1886, he helped found Grace Amy Zion Church. The congregation bought land here on Charlotte's South Brevard Street in what was then known as the Brooklyn neighborhood. Originally a wooden structure, the congregation soon raised funds to build this large brick church, which was dedicated in 1902. While the congregation moved to another location in later years, this historic building remains one of the few still standing from the old Brooklyn neighborhood. Tate was a strong supporter of education. In 1904, he was instrumental in the creation of the Brevard Street Public Library, which gave Charlotte's African-American community access to books. Tate was also president of the Afro-American Mutual Insurance Company. In 1922, he joined several other black businessmen to build the Mecklenburg Investment Company building. It was the first commercial building built exclusively by black professionals for black professionals. The building still stands on Brevard Street. Tate saw the need for a reform school to help African-American youth who found themselves in trouble with the law. One of Tate's regular barbershop customers was North Carolina Governor Cameron Morrison. The two men worked for the creation of what would eventually be known as the Morrison Training School, which opened in 1925 in Hoffman, North Carolina. A number of longtime Charlatines remember Tate's influence, including the late Daisy Stroud, who grew up across the street from the Tate family. He was significant because he represented the uh, industry that a black man would have, even though he was the color that he, he was. And when there were needs, people would call Tate. There were a great need for many things in, in the church during the earlier parts of the church and uh, quite often we have to call upon people outside of the community to give us help uh, and 
that was one of the things that uh, Mr. Tate was pretty much influential at. And he was very sincere in what he would say. It gave you motive uh, to go out and work towards some of the things that he has worked for and that he had hoped for as a black community. In addition to Tate's business and civic accomplishments, he was also a family man. He had um, 10 children, five boys and five girls. People fondly called them the Dozen family because the two parents and the 10 kids, uh, that's 12 people uh, affecting Charlotte. Joe and I are the last two living grandchildren. Pop's house, uh, the family home was on East 7th Street and around the corner was Caldwell Street and we were right around the corner at the first house, so our backyards ran together. Grandma Tate had a nice big garden in the backyard, and um, that helped, you know, with feed, do the feeding and everything, so, uh, and then they were very frugal people. They just didn't, you know, spend a lot of money. They just saved what they could, and then, worked out well. As my cousin said, my grandfather was a very frugal man. And so they had some store had a fire and uh, I was so happy he came home with a pair of saddle oxfords for me. And they were brand new, but they were cleaning out after this fire. He knew the f <laughs> he had 10 children and he knew he had to provide, uh, you know, for a while and he's prepared them for education and whatever else might come along. Thad Tate died in 1951. Jocelyn Tate Booker says it's important to remember the lesser known leaders who had a significant impact on the African American community and beyond. We knew that what he meant to this community and the growth of this not only this city, but this county. We need to show what more African Americans have done and in different areas of work, you know. He, and when the children go to school, they hear about um, Martin Luther King and they hear about George Washington Carver and just certain ones, but there are local people that are uh, so much uh, so valuable in the growth of a community. Uh, African American people that have done things that have not been recognized, but to, to recognize this is really a joy to our family. When the Trail of History Committee identified Tate to be honored with the statue, they commissioned Denver, Colorado artist Ed Dwight. His bronze work chronicling the African-American experience can be found all across the country, including the African-American History Monument at the South Carolina State Capitol. Art has always been a part of his life, but it wasn't his first career. I did go to engineering school and when I've got a degree in uh, aeronautical engineering. Dwight joined the United States Air Force in 1953. He served 14 years and reached the rank of captain. It was a pretty successful Air Force career, I guess. Uh, I was, I, I went, uh, got to be a test pilot, and, and, and President Kennedy uh, selected me the first, to be the first black astronaut uh, candidate. But he never made it to space. Following President Kennedy's assassination in 1963, Dwight says things changed. When he died, it changed the, it changed the rules of the game, so, uh, and it also kind of destroyed my Air Force career in a way. Uh, so I, I left there, came to Denver. When he got out of the Air Force, he pursued several other careers. But in the late 70s, he returned to his first passion, art. Dwight obtained his Master's of Fine Art at the University of Denver. Today, Dwight owns a studio and foundry. He says he does art with a purpose. And the purpose is, and sometimes there's a lot of angst because sometimes I just want to not want to do art with a purpose anymore and just do art about what's driving my instinct. Uh, but the mission that I'm on is a lot greater than that because uh, I'm trying to put, I'm trying to litter the landscape of America 
with, uh, with, with African American accomplishment. Dwight traveled to Charlotte in December of 2014 to meet with several Trail of History committee members to select the best location for the Tate statue. This is probably the most important part of the whole process because you got to fit him into the environment. Dwight's looking for specifics. And then you got to look at all the other art here. That's one of the reasons why the trip is so important as to stylistically, uh, because you don't want styles to clash too much even though you're looking for the variety of artists, the way artists interpret and the way they see things. And, and I, I want to look at the environment, uh, what kind of traffic goes by, uh, what kind of gestures or would be appropriate uh, to attract visitors. A few months after his fact-finding trip to Charlotte, Dwight provided the Trail of History Committee with a bronze maquette. A maquette can be done in clay, it can be done in wax, it can be done in any material, uh, you know, or it, it's a small model. Uh, and once you do that, you present this to the committee, and, and they have to use their imagination about what is this thing going to look like if it's enlarged to seven feet tall. Dwight takes the committee's comments from the maquette stage and starts the process to enlarge the sculpture. For this project, he had a company create a rough styrofoam enlargement. What they do is they bring it to me in a rough cut, then, uh, and I take my little scrapers and I scrape out all the excess stuff that's left because they'll leave marks on it where the thing didn't cut right and uh, underneath the ears because the little cutter can't get behind the ear and all that kind of stuff. So I get in there and I, I trim all that stuff off. Then I soften the clay, and then I just put clay all over them. Then I start modeling, as I get closer and closer to the surface, I, the, the modeling is finer and finer. And then when I finally get like his coat and stuff like that, we'll texture that, put the buttons on it. But I, you know, I use real buttons and, and stuff like that for credibility and all, you know. I don't, I don't model those things. Uh, so that's how we do it from the maquette to the enlarge. Uh, from here, uh, 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 like I said, we'll uh, cut it up, do a wax, cut the wax up in smaller, even smaller pieces, and we'll cast all, all those individual pieces into bronze. Uh, and then we'll start, after we cast them into bronze, we'll bring them in, uh, sandblast them, clean them up, and start assembling uh, the bronze pieces. Now this is the, uh, the final stage after we get through with all the welding and the, it's called chasing when you, uh, you know, do all the metal finishing and so in order to clean it up, we have to sandblast it uh, with, with glass beads in order to get all the dirt and, and to clear all the grease and everything off of it. And then we uh, apply a potash and it turns bronze black. Uh, and that's the underlayment. That's what gives you the three-dimensional effect of it. And then we brush it to get most of the black off so the black just stays in the crevices. What she's doing now is heating it up. In heating it, it opens the pores of the bronze up. And then when it cools, the color gets into those pores. And then when it cools, it closes the pores up, and that's what locks the color in. With the coloring and finishing complete, workers meticulously wrap the statue for shipping. With just four days before the statue dedication, stonemason James McCarthy and his crew from Icon Custom Masonry work quickly one worker grouts pavers. As McCarthy and Dwight peel away layers of packaging which protected the statue on the long trip from Colorado. Next, a worker with a heavy duty hammer drill bores deep holes in the stone base. Add a bit of muscle with a sledgehammer and the Thad Tate statue is lowered into place, ready for its official unveiling and dedication. For McCarthy and his crew, it's all in a day's work. It's a familiar process. Um, but it's challenging as far as, you know, the placement of it and working with the artist uh, in order to get it exactly uh, to represent what he wants it to look like when it's a finished product.
Members of the Grace Amy Zion Church sing as Thad Tate's descendants, friends, and community members gather for the statue dedication. Uh, once again, we are making history by celebrating history. Our mission is to recapture and preserve the significance of key people who contributed to the history, growth, and development of Mecklenburg County. We believe that the saving of history and the ability to use history to teach current generations and future generations is the way that we hopefully will not make the mistakes we've had in the past. This is a great honor today to be part of this, to recognize someone as prominent, as impactful, and as influential as Thaddeus Tate was. Opportunities have always abound in this community. And so from on behalf of the Amy Zion Church to have Mr. Tate, a good example of what one man can do in the daytime and be blessed with such a large, wonderful family, 10 children and a beautiful wife, and yet did not think it robbery to give so much of his time to bring up his fellow citizens. The Tate descendants are deeply touched by this great honor being given to our ancestor. We are proud to be part of this family, and we're very clear that we are standing on Thad Tate's shoulders. One, two, three, Thaddeus Tate. And at that moment, Tate's two surviving granddaughters see the finished statue for the first time. I was amazed, and tears came to my eyes, and it's still coming. It's so, the statue is all I expected and more. More. He's, he did a wonderful job, and I'm very happy about the whole thing, what was said and what all the organizations did to pull us together. Just did a great job. I, I just really get feel, filled up about it. You know, it's just such a loving tribute, and he was so worthy. I think it's beautiful work, uh, and uh, it's just so meaningful, you know, and all was in a lot of ways. Following the statue unveiling, attendees gather around to admire Dwight's artistic work up close. You know, there's a lot of euphoria associated with this whole process, and you hope like the devil because in a lot of unveilings, you don't get this. <laughs> you get an unveiling and everybody stands up and say, woo, and they leave. <laughs> and the fact that their family was here you know, kind of changed the formula a little bit, the fact and that so many of them came up, uh, made the whole thing a, a totally different experience. Trail of History board member and project manager, David Taylor. It's really an awesome day. I mean, it's a, it's a culmination of, of, I think, lots of great work over the past year. But I think being able to celebrate and see the family celebrating what it means to family and so many community people here, it really means that, you know, we made the right decision about about uh, Mr. Tate. And you know, as far as diversity, I think, I think one of the great things about the Trail of History Committee, we're about trying to get it right, telling real history. And uh, Charlotte's real history is a diverse history. So the inclusion of, a diverse, uh, of diverse candidates is just a natural part of that. Both Jocelyn Booker and Mae Jackson say their grandfather left a lasting impression on their lives. They hope this statue serves as a reminder to others of their grandfather's lasting impact on this community. That he did realize that there are people with needs and that uh, if you can spread the good news, do. <laughs> I think he did that in a way that was positive to both uh, whites and blacks. Just to be Easy going, but optimistic, and um, just know that you know you the things can be accomplished in a nice, quiet way, and just always try to do good deeds and think on the bright side of things. Yeah, he just he he was a wonderful man. He really was. He left he had you a lot to think about. Well, this concludes our look at the life of Thad Tate and his commemoration here on the Little Sugar Creek Greenway. We thank you for watching, and be sure to join us next time for a trail of history right here on WTVI PBS Charlotte.
a production of WTVI-PBS Charlotte.